hear some thoughts after somebody gave thanks for the bread, but the way the voice was fading in and out, I didn't catch that. So I think that's what happened. My apology with that. Um, maybe a little suggestion. I don't know whether it's possible to do it, but this has been very good. But I, I wonder if maybe there could be one camera at the front that we could see everybody. We would maybe have a feel of what's going on if that's possible the next time around. Let's get started. I'd ask you to turn with me to Psalm 69. I just shared a thought from there, and we're going to share all of our thoughts from there this morning. I know the last time that I was with you, I think it might have been April or May, um, I'd said the next time we get together, and for a few times after that, I'd probably be sharing thoughts about the name of God. Uh, one of the things in the name of God, Psalm 69, the last verse, it says, those that love the name of God, or speaks about the lovers of the name of God. I was drawn to that psalm because of my studies, and I got sidetracked. So we're going to get sidetracked here today and tomorrow, or next Sunday as well. So uh, the topic of the Lord's name, uh, I haven't forgotten it. We're going to bring it back up maybe the next time we're together. But we're going to switch uh, this morning and next Sunday in the morning. We're going to think about Psalm 69, and then in the evenings, we're going to be taking a look back at Leviticus and some of the offerings, a place that we seem to be afraid to go. If you're like me, when you're doing your through the Bible readings, when you get to some of the spots where the genealogies are there or the list of the kings or you get into Leviticus and it goes through all the sacrifices, I'm a slow reader, but when I get to those passages, I become a speed reader for some reason or other. And you just kind of fly through them. But uh, looking back at Leviticus, there's a lot in there that is there, not for the nation of Israel, but for the nation of Israel to be an example to show us. And I just want to try and look at it from a practical sense on the Sunday evenings. But this morning and next Sunday morning, we're going to look at Psalm 69 together as well. Um, this is David's psalm. There's a number of people that would think that Perhaps David wasn't the writer because you can't look at anything in the history of the scriptures that says that this psalm and the experience of it applies somewhere in David's life. And a lot of people would try and commentaries would try and point it towards Jeremiah's life, but there's, there's flaws in that too. To me, the record says that it was David. There's a sense to me that it is David's. We often think of David as that shepherd boy that uh, sat on a hillside in the evenings and would jot down poetry and write poetry for us, and then was a king of the people and led the people along the way. But in a sense, too, he was a prophet of God. He spoke on God's behalf um, on times with instructions for Solomon with the temple and so on. I think of this psalm as the heart of Christ speaking to David and allowing David's pen to record it, that we would have the privilege for both Psalm 22 and Psalm 69, the more I look at them, I think that this, the Spirit of Christ has given us a privilege to perhaps be in on a conversation between the heart of Christ and the heart of God when he was nailed to the tree. And that's how I look at these two Psalms pretty much in their entirety as I share this. Psalm 143, another Psalm of David, he would say, therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. That's kind of the day, isn't it? The 20, 2020 is like that, isn't it? We're overwhelmed. We're becoming desolate by the circumstances, not just of the, the virus, but all the other things in life going on. But in the midst of that, David would say, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the works of thy hands. And that's what we want to do, just muse on the works of his hands. I'm sure that when David wrote those words, he was probably thinking more of the wonder of creation and the hands of God in creation. But of all the works that God did, there is perhaps no greater than he, when he allowed his son's hands to be lifted up and nailed to that tree. And I want to just take the thoughts from Psalm 69 regarding his work at Calvary. Paul would write to us about reconciliation, and I draw my thoughts towards that. In Psalm 69 and verse 28, towards the end, he says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, 
commentaries uh, go back and forth on whether there's an Old Testament book of the living and a New Testament book of the living. And that the one in the Old Testament is the nation of Israel and they think about just their physical lives. But the, the one in Revelation is the book of the living, the Lamb's book of life, which is the eternal life. And uh, as he would open that book, it speaks about him opening the other books from which the dead will be judged. And as we think about that, the book of the Lamb, the book of life, and the book of the dead from which they'll be judged, those books have to be reconciled. Paul would write in Romans, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Even today, we've been reconciled to God by the death of his son. In Colossians, he would say, you who once were alienated and hostile in your minds, he is now reconciled in his body by his flesh, body of his flesh, by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And as I think about this, this psalm has a few verses that speak about the Lord and his trespass offering, and which is a, a part of what he did in reconciling us to himself. Paul says in Colossians there that he didn't just reconcile us to himself, but everything that was in heaven and earth was reconciled to the Lord. And we want to think about that through this psalm. But we want to think about it in light of the words that are here are the voice of the, the son to his father. As, if you were to read this psalm in its entirety, you would get the sense that it's broken down into three sections. And the first section is from verses 1 to 21. And you get the division by the sense of the voice, the tone of the voice. And as we would read this, you would see it. It's the voice of one that's suffering, one that is struggling. Uh, but then the voice changes in the middle section, and then it changes again in the last section of the, of the psalm. And we're going to look at those two sections, Lord willing, next Sunday. But this morning, we just want to think about this one, whose voice is the tone of one that's suffering from the agony of the judgment that he's going through at Calvary. We just want to take a few moments. We're not going to read the psalm in its entirety. We'll just read a, a portion of it together. The first um, 13 vo verses we'll just read here together. And as we read these, you might just want to keep in mind, um, one of the things that I do when I study, I try and read something several times just to get a, a bird's eye view of it, I guess, and the sense of it. And the next thing I do, I look for important words or words that are repeated quite often. And usually those tend to be descriptive words or action words. But as you go through this psalm, you see something that jumps out at you. As, as Christ speaks here, we see the word me, my, mine, I. And he just keeps re repeating that. Almost 70 times he uses those four words in, in this one chapter. And if we knew nothing of the scripture and we just read this psalm, we'd probably say, this guy is really self-centered. He really thinks about himself, and it's all about him. Uh, but as we get to know Christ and who he is, we begin to realize the truth of it, don't we? That it is all about him, that he is the center of everything. He is the center of creation. He is the center of all of creation, the universe, of us. He's the center of my love. He's the center of my joy. He's the center of my hope. He's the center of everything for me from past, present, and into the future. So he has a right to speak in this manner, doesn't he? And maybe as we read it, you'll just sense that. But at the same time as he does that, though he speaks of himself about 70 times, he speaks of his father. He says, my God, oh Lord, oh God, maybe 40 times. So in this wondrous psalm, while we have a picture of him on the tree, suffering for our sins. We see the strength of the bond between the Father and the Son and his trust in him and his deliverance that comes from that. So let's just take a few moments and read the first 13 verses. I'm going to read from the ESV. To the choir master, according to the lilies of David, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck or my soul. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. 
My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I do not steal must I now restore. O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs that I have done are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope or wait in you be put to shame through me. O oh Lord God of hosts, let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me. O oh God of Israel, for it is your sake that I have borne reproach. The dishonor has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's sons. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the talk of those who sit in the gate and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God. In the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. And we'll just stop there now and consider some thoughts, mainly coming from the first four or five verses here. One of the other things that you'll notice as you read this psalm, we think about all that we have in Christ and all that we have been given in Christ. But as he went to the cross to reconcile that book of life, that we could be in it and have all of these things, you can't help but sense what he was without during this. In verse 2, it says that he had no foothold, no place to stand. This is the rock upon which we stand. For me to be able to say that, he had to sink in the deep mire. Verse 3, he would say, my throat is parched. No refreshment at all. But we can come to the living water and never thirst again because of him. My eyes, they go dim, he would say. He had no light, no guidance. But we have him as a way and a light for all of eternity. Verse 3, he says, I'm waiting for my God. No God. We have a God that says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Verse 8, he says, I have become a stranger, a stranger. No family or acquaintance is around about him, and we are never left absent from fellowship with God and with one another. In verse 11, he says, I made sackcloth my clothing. He gave up all his majesty and glory. He had no dignity at all that we could be exalted to be with him and enjoy his glory, and we are clothed in his righteousness. Verse 20, he looked for some to take pity, for some to take comfort, and he found none. But we have the God of all comfort. And we just want to appreciate some of these things that uh, we have because of what he gave up. May we never forget that. Verse 4, he says, they hated me without a cause. Sounds like peculiar words, doesn't it? To think of a man being on the cross, and while he's on the cross and looking down, he can't see any reason at all why they would hate him in such a manner to do that to him. But as we would look at scripture, we realize that there is reasons for it, and we'll consider those in just a moment. But as we, before we consider that, I just want to think about one more thing here. We often say, he died for us. And we say it in general terms, and we kind of say it, quite often corporately like that, and uh, rightfully so, because uh, Paul writes that way in a number of his epistles. We would hear things like this, even Christ, our Passover, is a sacrifice for us. He made him to be sin for us. He has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling savor to God. He gave himself for us that we might be redeemed from all iniquity and pur purified unto himself. He died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, that we would live again for us, for us. But there's one time when Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, he says that he gave himself for me. And we don't want to forget that. We often think corporately of what he has done for us. But we've just remembered the one who died on the cross for the world. But if you alone were the world he would have still gone to the cross. 
It is a personal thing. He died for us. We often say he stood in our place, don't we? He stood in our place. He took our place. Overwhelmed by sin, his soul standing before God, and not as one born in sin, but one who became sin for us. Not as one who was shaped in iniquity, but they light on him the iniquity of us all. He was bruised for our iniquities, wasn't he? This is what he faced. And I want you to just ponder for a moment this thought of you as an individual meeting God face to face in your sins. The defilement that would be sensed on your face from God as you faced his intrinsic beauty, the holiness of God, the shame and the dishonor, the remorse that would be there in your face blended in with the anguish of the sense of the wrath that was coming down upon you for none can live in the presence of God with their sin still in existence. You would desire, you would hope that it would end and end very soon. But yet at the same time as you desired that, you would sense the justification that what God was doing to you was right. Now as we take that as an individual, we can say that God died for us, but we need to say that he died for me. It was a very personal thing that he was going through on the cross, dying for the sins of the world, but he was dying for the sins of David Reed. He felt the burden of my sins. He felt the shame that I should have felt, the disgrace that I should have felt. And then you compound that with all the individuals he died for. And it's hard to imagine what he went through on the cross to reconcile my sins and your sins before God. He was accused. He was ashamed. He was afflicted. He died alone, didn't he? But he died as I should have died. In a sense, I can say that he died not just for me, but he died, asked me, didn't he? Romans 6 kind of teaches us that in the principle of baptism. This was personal. And our reaction to it needs to be personal in our own life too, doesn't it? And we need to remember that. The death he died, it was because of the life that I lived. Those two can never be separated. He died my death. And now he encouraged us to live his life. But this morning, we want to think more about his work and his reconciliation, what he did for us. As we were thinking about the things that were absent from his life, he said, they hated me without a cause, that there was no reason for what they did. At least if you were to ask them, they couldn't explain what they did. We would maybe say, don't take it personally. But it was personal, wasn't it? But as you look at the scripture, the Lord does give causes for it. In John chapter 18, Pilate would ask him there, are, are you the king? Are you really the king of the Jews here? And the Lord would say, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. He came to be evidence, to be truth. He that has seen me has seen the Father. So as we've seen the truth in Christ, we see the truth of his heavenly Father the love, the depth of the love, how low he would go for us, the importance of it, that we would have a savior, that our life and the things attributed to us could be reconciled before a holy and a just God. That was the cause. In John chapter 12, he would say, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this. But for this cause came I into this hour. And what was that cause? He would say that the Son of Man should be glorified, that the Son of Man could be manifest, that we could see truly who he is. In Hebrews, it says, for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that the means of death for the redemption of the transgression, that were under the First Testament. This is the cause. They which were called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And he also says in Romans 15, he quotes from Psalm 18, the, the Lord speaking, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. The cause that the Gentiles might be able to glorify God. 
So as we would look at Calvary and we would say, what a mistake, what a shame, this should never have happened. There was no reason for it to happen. In the eyes of a holy and a just God, there was every reason for it to have to happen. And you and I were the reasons that his son had to go through this, that our lives could be reconciled, that one day we could be face to face with him, not in fear and shame, but in joy and rejoicing. I want to look at verse 4 in particular this morning. Verse 4, there's four things in this verse that I just want to consider with you. Let's just read that verse together again. These four things. He says, more in number than the hairs of my head are those that hate me without a cause. More in number than the hairs of my head. This to me speaks about the multitude that were against him today. And these things all have to do with the reconciliation and the completeness of his reconciliation. So the first thing we see here is he's on the cross. More in number than the hairs of my head, the multitude that is there. Then he says, mighty are those who would destroy me. It speaks to the magnitude of the enemies that were up against him that day. And then he would say, those who attack me with lies. It speaks to the level of the maligning that he went through. He came, his cause was to be truth, to reveal truth, but the maligning, the lies that he went through. So we see these three things, the enemies that he faced that day, the maligning, the magnitude of the enemies, and the, and the multitude of the enemies as well. As we think about that, as I thought about it, my thoughts went to Ephesians. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And those are the words of Paul to us. And we think about ourselves wrestling that way. But the man that hung on the cross 2,000 years ago was just that, wasn't he? He was the man, flesh and blood, as we are. And he wrestled not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Lord wrestled against those things on Calvary. So as we think about more in number than the hairs of the head, it wasn't a couple of hundred people at the foot of the cross. It was all of man, women, and child of creation, but it was beyond that. It was the principalities, the powers, the rule of darkness. These were all of his enemies that he was wrestling about, fighting against that day. And they were a piece of the puzzle, weren't they? Because when it comes to Revelation chapter 20, and the Lamb one day will open that book of life, and my name will be in it. I have no fear. I can have full confidence in the work of what Christ did. He allowed that day. He made it necessary that all of mankind would be against them. All the principalities and the powers would be against them. So that, that day when he opens that book up and he says, David Reed has no fault in him. Everything has been covered. Everything is perfect. There is not one person, not one principality, one power that can question that. They've been evidence to the experience of that. They threw everything that they had at Christ on the cross that day. And as a result of that, he can open up that book and the reconciliation will be perfect. In the last 15 years with dealing with my account and my business, every year at the end of the year, we go through the reconciliation and it would never balance it would always be out by little. It was usually a question of exchange in Canadian U.S. dollars because of my business. But the response was always, don't worry about it. It's only a few dollars and it's just the government. We don't have to worry about this because everything will be perfectly balanced from the eyes of a holy and a just God. And it will be perfectly balanced from those that will be looking for every excuse as to why they shouldn't be cast into the lake of fire. And there will be no excuses, no reasons. The book with my name it will be perfectly balanced. And we can joy in that, I think. But as we look at this verse, more in number than the hairs of my head, mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. Those three things, the multitude, the magnitude, and the malign that he went through for my reconciliation. Look at the last phrase that says, what I did not steal, what I did not steal, I must now restore. It speaks to his mercy, doesn't it? The loving kindness of God, and it trumps the first three completely. But as you think of those words, what I did not steal, and I must now restore, 
It speaks to us of one portion of his offering, the trespass offering. And tonight we're going to start to take a glimpse at the five different offerings that are a piece of the wonderful puzzle of this one who gave himself once for all. But he says, what I did not steal must I now restore. Uh, Rotherham, in his translation of the Emphasized Bible, he says, what I had not plundered, then had I to restore? It's almost like a question. He's sitting, he's hanging on that cross. They've accused him of everything. They've accused him of stealing. Stuff that he did not steal. The psalmist would say, false witnesses came up against me. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. He knows everything. He knows the secrets of my heart, but he's never experienced stealing anything from anybody, taking anything. But this verse he's saying, those things that I plundered, those things that were snatched away quickly as though it was a sudden robbery, I must now pay back. And that speaks to what he did in the trespass offering that helped to reconcile what's beside my name in the book of life and what's beside your name in the book of life as well. And we just want to think about that a little. The question we might ask ourselves first off is, who stole it? Three questions I guess we could ask ourselves. Who did the stealing? And what was stolen? And what effect did it really have? Well, since he took my sins upon him, he was the one that also took upon him the guilt of it, that he stole these things. And he was being judged for that. But he wasn't a thief, was he? It really was sin that was a thief in all of these things. So we think about Christ, and I think about him hanging on the tree and saying these words, the things that I did not take. This was a man who fasted in the wilderness for 40 days with nothing. This is the one who owned one coat. He had nowhere to lay his head. All he did was give to those that couldn't hear, hearing, to those that couldn't see, sight, to those that couldn't speak, speech. That those that had physical difficulties, he healed them and allowed them to have mobility to walk again. He had done nothing but give. He had not taken anything. But yet to reconcile the books for you and I, he took this upon him. It was really us and our sin that did the snatching. And we stole from, I think, as we look at scripture, we stole from three places. The first one that we stole from was we stole from mankind. And this all started with the sin in the garden, didn't it? But as we continue to sin, we still continue to rob in a way, don't we? We snatched from ourselves and from other mankind. In my sin, I snatched my hope away, my joy away, the peace that I could have for eternity. These were all snatched away from me, by me. God says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. When God speaks that to us, it's an expectation that the command will be followed, and God expects us to follow it. But you know what? Our neighbors could have that same expectation because God says it. So we ought to be loving our neighbors, but we snatch that away from them at times too, haven't we, in our sin? I think of our fulfillment of uh, creation. We were created for his glory. When I sinned i stole my ability to be able to glorify him in the way that he wanted me to glorify him my communion my fellowship with him because our relationship was broken the communion and the fellowship was was damaged with him too i'd lost that i'd stolen my innocence my sinlessness i'd robbed myself of all of these things the light that i had the, you think of adam walking in the garden with the lord himself and it became darkness now the vision. We lost our vision. Without a vision, the people perish. We had no hope in these things. Amen. But these are all things that Christ says, they've thrown the things at me that I have not stolen. Must I now restore them? And he needs to restore them. But I think also the things that were snatched from Christ through my sins. Hebrews 12 would say, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. His joy was taken from him, just snatched right out from under him through our sin. John chapter 17, in his intimate prayer with his father, he would say, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. His glory was diminished too, wasn't it? He was robbed of that, just as his father also was robbed of it. 
We think about his father. He says, you sold yourselves for nothing. Nothing. He had created us for his purpose. We were his people, and we abandoned that. The fullness of the son and the fullness of the father's joy were robbed from them. The fullness of both of them, their glory and their honor that should have been there, recognized by all of his creation, not just the world, but the creatures in it, mankind. And we robbed him of all of that. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, thy strength. We robbed him. We snatched that out from under him in all of this. But by the grace and the mercy of God, he says, must I now restore it? And we just want to think about this trespass offering. I'd ask you to turn back with me to Leviticus. This will start to wet our whistle for this evening, hopefully. But Leviticus chapter, chapter 1. Not sure how much time we have here, but Leviticus chapter 1. Sorry, chap chapter 5, not chapter 1. Chapter 1 is this evening. I'm jumping ahead already. Chapter 5, chapter 5 and verse 14. And your, your Bibles, you may have a heading there that says the laws for the trespass offerings or the laws for the, the um, guilt offerings. And so from chapter... 5 and verse 14 through to chapter 6 and verse 7. It speaks to these laws to do with the trespass offering. Uh, the other four offerings are already been covered in the previous chapter, and we're going to dabble a little bit in those in the evenings. But let's just read a portion of this together, and uh, we won't read it all. Verse 14. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, if anyone commits a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation a ram without blemish, blemish out of the flock, valued in silver shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for a guilt offering. He shall also make restitution for what he has done amiss in the holy thing, and shall add a fifth to it, and give it to the priest, and the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. If anyone sins doing any of the things that by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done, though he did not know it, then realizes his guilt, he shall bear his iniquity. He shall bring to the priest a ram without blemish out of the flock, or its equivalent, for a guilt offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for the mistake that he made unintentionally, and he shall be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He has indeed incurred guilt before the Lord. Verse 1 chapter 6 the Lord spoke to Moses saying if anyone sins and commits a breach of faith or a trespass against the Lord by deceiving a neighbor and then we'll stop there as so we just for the sake of time in this he speaks here about the trespass offering and what the Lord has done for us and this speaks very much of the reconciliation that goes on here all of the offerings in Leviticus have some common things to them when you look at the offering, it, it, there's a sense of confusion or complexity to it. There's the five offerings, but there's variations within the offering. And those variations just are simply there to help us to understand the depth of what Christ has done for us, to help us to appreciate it from different perspectives. It's kind of like walking around a building. As you walk around the building, you're still looking at the one building but you're seeing it from different views. And then if you go inside, you see it from another view. And that's what Leviticus does for us. We get to walk around and see Christ and what he has done in so many different ways. But as we look at this trespass offering and the variations that are here, we see in verse 15 of chapter five, he says, if anyone, that is if any soul commits a trespass or a breach of faith and sins unintentionally in any of the holy things of the Lord, as we think about this in the New Testament, we realize that the holy things of the Lord spoken about here are the components, the articles of the tabernacle that they had in the wilderness. And I think it perhaps speaks to all of them, not just the things that were in the building itself, but the gate, the curtains, the, the sockets that the posts were put in, that the walls or the curtains were on around about. 
um, the labor for cleansing, the brazen altar for the sacrifices. So when you go inside the table of showbread, the lampstand, the table of incense, the mercy seat, the curtain between, all of these things to me in a sense are the holy things that he speaks about in this verse. And if any man commits a breach, knowingly or unintentionally against these things, it's a trespass and it needs to be reconciled. There's a wonderful verse in Luke chapter 1 that we don't really think about until we hit December and close to Christmas. But we would read this, The angel answered and said unto Mary, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born shall be called the Son of God. If anyone commits a trespass, a breach of faith against the holy thing of the Lord, it needs to be reconciled. And that's what he's doing when he's on the cross. He says, must I also reconcile all of these things, pay back the price for all of these things? In verse 17 of chapter 5, he also says, if anyone sins doing any of the things that, that by the Lord's commandments are not to be done, if we break any of the Lord's commandments, they need to be reconciled. Verse 1 of chapter 6, if any soul sins and commits a breach of faith against the Lord but this, by deceiving his neighbor, against our neighbors. It has to be dealt with too. Uh, simply put, we look at David's life, don't we? We think of David with Bathsheba and uh, Uriah. And when Nathan came before David and confronted him with what he did, what was his response? Against thee, thee only have I sinned. Uh, the little grudges that we have with the neighbors, the little things that we have done, they all come back to God and need to be reconciled before God. Well, through the trespass offering and the sin offering, he does that. And we're just taking a glimpse this morning at the trespass offering. If you look at these verses that we have just read in verse 15, it says, He shall bring to the Lord as his compensation a ram. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. We've got to remind ourselves here that as he went to that cross, he shed his blood that we could have the forgiveness of our sins. And the cost was there of him him shedding his blood to do that. But then it goes on and it says to that there's compensation that has to be there according to the shekel of the sanctuary. As I understand that, the priests were appointed standards by which God's rights were measured. And there had to be compensation. And it wasn't just the blood of the lamb. There had to be compensation for the damage that was done to God's rights in this. But then he also goes on and says that he shall make restitution and shall add a fifth to it. Whatever the cost of it, it wasn't just the blood that had to be shed, but for the reconciliation to take place, he had to add a fifth to it. If you were to go back down through the rest of this chapter and you would see the three different variations of it, in each case, these things came up where he had to make restitution for all of this. And this to me is just the, the wonder of it. We tend to look back and think this is the ritual that the nation of Israel went through. But this was a type of a heavenly pattern. The heavenly pattern that you and I, who live in eternal life right now, we live in the eternal sphere of being in Christ. We are experiencing the picture that is in this trespass offering. Christ came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to fulfill just pieces of it. He had to fulfill it in its entirety. And I believe that goes to what is happening here too. Through what the, the nation of Israel and the people did when they did their offers, they couldn't completely satisfy God in these things. They couldn't make retribution back to their neighbors and all of these things. But Christ came to fulfill the law. And so it's my name in the book of life and everything being reconciled all the things that I've done against my neighbors, that I've done against the commands of the Lord, that I have done in, against in offense to the holy things, including his son. All of those things have been completely reconciled, scripture tells me, according to the standards that God has placed on them. But I don't, not only that, and I don't understand this, I can't explain it away, but not only has it been paid, but he shall also make restitution and shall add a fifth to it. In his mercy and his grace, 
to make sure in the book of life that everything has been cleared from my name. He has paid for everything and then some to ensure it. And I just want to leave that little thought with you in the matter of our restoration before the Lord. All of these things that he has done for us. The surety of the reconciliation is through him, the proof of what he has done, through the eyes of a holy God who knows everything, who sees the secret of the heart. God says everything is complete. The surety of all that, and it's fully complete. The fullness of the reconciliation is taken apart from the multitudes and the magnitudes and the malign, from the all of his enemies, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, they will all in that day look at it and they will not be able to put a question mark beside anything that has been covered by his blood for me and for you. So as we leave here, may we just rejoice in the wonder of the work of just this one portion of the trespass offering. Every sinner that has ever come to trust him Every one of his sins in Christ, the unblemished offering, judgment has been satisfied. Restitution has been made. It's been atoned for. It's been covered. And we've been forgiven. And it's through that that we have peace. And we look forward for that day that we can be, been with him, be with him. So we just leave these thoughts with you now. And I'll just close in prayer. Our God and our Father. We do thank you. We think of the wonders of uh, your book and how you share in so many different ways. But to, to think that you would share with us the experience of thy son. Uh, you covered this earth with the darkness for the hours. You would not have us to be able to see the shame and the glory that your son was going through for each one of us. But yet you're willing to share in these few verses something of what was on his heart and the agony that he went through but more so of the wonders of what he did for us. And we would just pray that in our own lives, that we would never fail to remember the wonders of the work of Calvary and the wonders of the work of your son. May we never fail to lift him up, to exalt him as we were considering early this morning for all that he has done for us. Help us to remember these things. Help us to do these things for thy glory and for thy honor. Amen. For those on Zoom, the meeting will now be over, and in about 10 seconds, I will shut it down. Enjoy your afternoon, and we'll see you tonight.